selections from the old librarian's almanac by philo biblos a very rare pamphlet first published in new haven connecticut in 1773 and now reprinted for the first time this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org preface nathaniel cutter esq who for over fifty years had practised law in newburyport massachusetts died on march ninth nineteen o seven his executor asked me to arrange and catalogue the books which composed mr cutter's library they were in his office in an old brick building on state street and if dust and cobwebs may be taken as evidence many of the books had not been disturbed for thirty or forty years the library was almost entirely composed of legal works of no especial interest there were in addition a file of the newburyport herald from eighteen fifty to eighteen ninety five and a large number of old almanacs mr cutter seems to have taken great pains to gather almanacs and his collection has passed into the possession of the newburyport antiquarian society acknowledgments are due that society for permission to make this reprint of the most interesting of the collection it is the first complete reprint of the old librarian's almanac though one or two extracts from it have appeared in the boston evening transcript after a long search i have found record of only one other copy of the almanac the preliminary checklist of american almanacs compiled by mr hugh alexander morrison of the library of congress probably the most complete work of the kind in existence makes no mention of it but at the sale of the library of the hon john stepney wales in new york november sixteenth eighteen ninety six a copy was sold for fourteen dollars to dr morris kimball of st louis dr kimball writes me however that his copy is imperfect the title page and covers are missing the question of authorship of the almanac is the only other point which needs to be mentioned the identity of philo biblos appears to be established by the fact that the copy owned by dr kimball has in manuscript on the page for the month of march the words writ by me jared bean in both that copy and the one which i found in the library of mr cutter the initials j b are printed at the end of the poem they have been retained here out of respect for the whim of the old librarian who evidently rather fancied himself as a versifier jared bean whose name to-day is so nearly forgotten is mentioned in sarah gilman bigelow's literary and genealogical annals of connecticut new york eighteen seventy he was born in new haven in seventeen o five or seventeen o six about seventeen fifty four he became curator or librarian of the connecticut society of antiquarians situated in his native town in this congenial post he spent so far as we know the remainder of his life his will to which mrs bigelow had access was proved in seventeen eighty eight and that is taken as the approximate date of his death the old librarian never accepted the results of the american revolution which broke out soon after the publication of his almanac and toward his sovereign lord king george the third retained his allegiance to the end he kept the king's birthday each year but there is no indication that he took any part in public affairs or devoted himself to anything but his beloved books he believed with sir thomas bodley that a librarian should never marry and he died a bachelor his character is so well displayed in his almanac as to require no other description whatever we may think of his ideas of librarianship his right to his favourite appellation of book-lover is not to be denied mrs bigelow saw his gravestone in eighteen sixty nine in the old east hill burying-ground near new haven she writes that the dates and most of the inscription had become obliterated but that the name jared bean philo biblos remained together with the epitaph 
death thou hast closed the book of life and set me free from earthly strife the page is turned and i'm at rest the last word said finitum est this bit of doggerel undoubtedly the work of some professional epitaph monger would have displeased jared bean though he might have taken consolation in remembering the verse on shakespeare's grave but the headstone and even the burying ground itself have disappeared and an electric car line runs through the place where the old librarian was buried edmund lester pearson zealandia lodge asheville north carolina may nineteen nineteen o nine reader this the first issue of the old librarian's almanac is not offered to the public notice without diffidence nor laid before my learned brethren without hesitation indeed as it is more especially addressed to my learned brethren the librarians or bibliothecaries of these colonies it now seems a fitting time to make my humble apologies for the inadequacy of the work and to pray their kind indulgence for many failings i have striven to set forth correct astronomical information in those parts of the almanac where such matters are suitable the other pages i have devoted to advice and counsel which i trust may be of service to librarians and lovers of true literature of the compositions in the poetic art those wanderings on the slopes of parnassus if i may so phrase it which i have essayed i refrain from speaking in concluding i trust i may be allowed to state that if the old librarian's almanac prove useful and pleasing to its readers it will be my privilege to appear before you from year to year i remain your humble obedient servant philo biblos november sixteenth seventeen seventy three one month january begins on saturday proud leader of the months whose ancient name recalls the god who faced both ways the same when thy bleak winds roar down the icy hills and men for safety turn to draughts and pills serenely we may view thy frosty looks and seek for calm security in books what reck we then thy blustering tempests wild who reads is from all miseries beguiled january hath thirty-one days seventeen seventy four the librarian may be justly compared with him who keeps an armory of weapons for as the keeper doth neither forge the implements of war nor employ them on the field of battle so neither doth the librarian compose the learned works which are under his charge nor use their wisdom in his own especial interest but like that other keeper it is his duty to see that his armory which is the library be well stocked with the fittest weapons and that they may be put into the hands of such as can use them at the proper time the metaphor need not stop at this neither for even as the weapons of the armory are unfitted for the hands of all so the books the weapons over which the librarian is custodian are oft times dangerous and harmful if they come to the hands of persons ill-fitted to peruse them mr pope an able poet though a papist warns us that a little learning is a dangerous thing drink deep or taste not the pyrian spring the wisdom of such advice and the folly of not observing it may be seen nowadays when demagogues and others of shallow intellect seek to stir up sedition and revolt whence it appears that it is as custos librorum as the ancients called him or guardian of the books that the librarian exercises his true function i am sensible that there will be some who will inquire as to what qualities should be possessed by him who stands thus as guardian of the books these may think if perchance the hasty and frivolous workings of their ill-taught minds may be so dignified as to term it thinking that it matters little what the character of the librarian be such as these cannot too soon become aware of their error 
for how can it be possible that a man can act as warder of the accumulated record of the world's wisdom piety learning and experience and hold the same in necessary reverence if he be not a person of sober and godly life learned virtuous chaste moral frugal and temperate this should be the character of the librarian and it is such as he that i would extol as through these pages i offer for your benefit the results of twenty years of labour in our honourable profession two month february begins on tuesday when february sleets and fogs abound and melting snow lies trampled on the ground when all the ways are dismal foul and drear in books behold a recompense and cheer if pelting rain or windy tempest rage all's fair and calm upon the printed page though boisterous elements may rule the scene look to your shells there's peace and joy serene february hath twenty-eight days seventeen seventy four you shall choose your books with care and circumspection when you have determined that it is prudent to purchase a certain work do so cautiously and make a shrewd bargain with the vendor it will then be your duty to peruse the volume even if as doubtless will be the fact you have scanned it before buying do not let the importunities of persons who come to the library hasten you in the performance of this task they should be content to wait for the book until you have satisfied yourself of its contents there will then remain the necessity of recording its acquisition in your ledgers of record as for the entry of its style and title in the catalogue many counsel that this is not needful since you may be expected to remember that the book has been purchased for the library it may however occupy your leisure moments some would advise that if it be a volume of sermons it be placed on the shelves with others of its like or if it be a work of natural philosophy it stand near the volumes of that class this is a waste of labour assign it a number which shall correspond to its position on the shelf and shall be the next in sequence from the latest book which you have added and so let them stand in the order in which they are received for surely if you desire to find a number of volumes of sermons it will be an easy matter for you recalling when they were purchased to pluck them from their several resting-places keep your books behind stout gratings and in no wise let any person come at them to take them from the shelf except yourself have in mind the counsel of master enoch sneed that most worthy librarian who says it were better that no person enter the library save the librarian himself and that the books be kept in safety than that one book be lost or others misplaced guard well your books this is always your foremost duty three month march begins on tuesday third of the train the month of mars comes in both rain and snow the vernal tide begin the god whose son erected mighty rome now lives in written sheet and printed tome the warlike patron of these blustering weeks led once the trojans gainst the armed greeks and fitting tis your leisure to employ in reading of the deeds neath windy troy march hath thirty-one days seventeen seventy four ars bibliothecarii first of all matters tis your greatest need to read unceasing and unceasing read when one book's ended with a mind unvexed turn then your whole attention to the next let not intrude to all the world be blind and chase each vain allurement from your mind be also deaf tis well to turn the lock and let who will the outer portal knock behold in books your raiment and your bread so lacking books you're neither warmed nor fed choose then with care repudiate the chaff 
or see corruption spoil the better half for one base volume spreads the poison through a single traitor can a host undo as books like men go better neatly dressed let paper print and binding be the best your books obtained behold the problem rise how best secure them from unworthy eyes or graver yet to guard lest you're bereft by fire worms or absent omen theft remember this they're safe upon the shelf when none has access thither but yourself as you to guard them best are qualified so you to read them clearly tis implied be vigilant your treasury to keep in watchful care know neither rest nor sleep all other readers better far keep out than put the safety of your books in doubt and first or last this precept ever heed to read unceasing and unceasing read j b four month april begins on friday fair april slandered month whose balmy days less censure oft deserve and more of praise a wayward maiden fain to weep or sing the sweet enchantress of the budding spring neath thy soft rule what book so fit to read when seeking rest by brook and verdant mead as thine old flaccus safe from war's alarm and bowsed in plenty on thy sabine farm april hath thirty days seventeen seventy four towards the persons who frequent your library maintain a courteous demeanour but the utmost vigilance for as it is your duty to guard well the books which are the riches of your treasury so you cannot afford to relax those restrictions which may save you from despoilment and the most grievous loss the biblioclept or thief of books is your eternal foe john milton truly wrote for books are not absolutely dead things but do contain a potency of life in them to be as active as that soul was whose progeny they are nay they do preserve as in a vial the purest efficacy and extraction of that living intellect that bred them this then is the value of a book in the mind of that great poet how far beyond mere gold or silver is the worth of a book and how filthy and base the act of one who steals a book but there be sneaking unutterable villains who will enter a library and in their furtive and detestable fashion carry from it one of its treasures and what condemnation shall befit the accursed wretch for he cannot justly claim the title of man who pilfers and purloins for his own selfish ends such a precious article as a book i am minded of the warning displayed in the library of the popish monastery of san pedro at barcelona this is the version englished by sir matthew mahon who saw it writ in latin in the monastery as he himself describes in his learned book travels in spanish countries seventeen twelve the warning reads thus for him that stealeth a book from this library let it change to a serpent in his hand and rend him let him be struck with palsy and all his members blasted let him languish in pain crying aloud for mercy and let there be no surcease to his agony till he sink to dissolution let bookworms gnaw his entrails in token of the worm that dieth not and when at last he goeth to his final punishment let the flames of hell consume him for ever and aye five month may begins on sunday now may her mantle spreads o'er hill and plain and soft warm days succeed to april's rain the feathered songsters chirp about the nest and nature puts forth beauties never guessed in each new leaf that burgeons on the tree a page of nature's manuscript we see 
while fields and meadows every day unroll like cryptic writing on a wizard's scroll may hath thirty-one days seventeen seventy four of the enemies of books i especially esteem the cockroach that worthy librarian master enoch sneed for whom i profess my reverent admiration would have it that the domestic mouse building her nest as she will mid the tatters of our most precious volumes more fairly merits the name of chief destroyer but though it be true that the ravage wrought by the mouse is complete yet she and her kind may be exterminated and the library rid of her presence with no great ado but the cockroach more elusive in his habits and not less insidious in his character spreads destruction wherever his footsteps may wander and he is a greater bother to remove in view of the celerity of his movements and the amazing fecundity with which he reproduces his kind some may question if the nature of the destruction wrought by this pestilential insect be of serious import but i do earnestly assure all such that i have witnessed with my own eyes appalling injuries inflicted on the most precious books in my custody and these injuries i am convinced were justly chargeable to this hard-shelled rogue who scuttles about the bookshelves and owns no restraint upon his ungovernable appetite for the cockroach will so gnaw and devour the bindings so prey upon the leaves of old books that i have been moved nearly to an access of tears when i have gazed upon the ruin which he has left after him with devilish cunning he will come at only the rare and costly volumes picking them out it would seem as by the leadership of satan and visiting upon them his own foul mutilation i have found the following preparation to be highly serviceable to three minims of distilled henbane add four drops of the tincture of saffron take this mixture and combine it with half a gill of the liquor which comes from boiling a peck of common tansy after allowing it to cool add four great spoonfuls of pure vinegar a pinch of powdered rhubarb and the juice of a score of mulberries heated well the resulting compound should be kept in a jar tightly sealed and sprinkled on the bookshelves or wherever the enemy are seen six month june begins on wednesday with june at last the longest days appear the welcome climax of the growing year when blossoms carpet all the bills and fields and blooming flora rich abundance yields though joyous nature calls you to herself enduring joys are ranged upon the shelf and puck and pyramus a vision weave in woods near athens on midsummer's eve june hath thirty days seventeen seventy four so far as your authority will permit of it exercise great discrimination as to which persons shall be admitted to the use of the library for the treasure-house of literature is no more to be thrown open to the ravages of the unreasoning mob than is a fair garden to be laid unprotected at the mercy of a swarm of beasts question each applicant closely see that he be a person of good reputation scholarly habits sober and courteous demeanour any mere trifler a person that would dally with books or seek in them shallow amusement shall be dismissed without delay no person younger than twenty years save if he be a student of more than eighteen years and vouched by his tutor is on any pretext to enter the library be suspicious of women they are given to the reading of frivolous romances and at all events their presence in a library adds little to if it does not indeed detract from that aspect of gravity seriousness and learning which is its greatest glory you will make no error in excluding them altogether 
even though by that act it befall that you should prohibit from entering some one of these excellent females who are distinguished by their wit and learning there is little chance that you or i sir will ever see such an one let no politician be in your library nor no man who talks over much it will be difficult for him to observe silence and he is objectionable otherwise as well no astrologer necromancer charlatan quack nor humbug no vendor of nostrums nor teacher of false knowledge no fantastic preacher nor refugee admit no one of loose or evil life prohibit the gamester the gipsy the vagrant allow none who suffers from an infectious disease and none whose apparel is so gaudy or eccentric as to attract the eye keep out the light-witted the shallow the base and obscene see to it that none enter who are senile and none who are immature in their minds even though they have reached the required age seven month july begins on friday as mighty caesar like the burning sun flamed o'er the nations where his course was run so thou his namesake in the effulgent sky art conqueror imperial july the world without is hot thy fiery breath consumes the tender plants in early death the wise will shun the overheated air in shady alcoves find seclusion fair july hath thirty-one days seventeen seventy four about this time prepare for the annual examination close your library not later than august one having given due notice that all books must be returned under pain of expulsion see that every book the library owns is in its proper place on the shelf by the first day of the month it will perchance be necessary for you to seek some of them yourself taking care at the same time to administer a reproof to the delinquent ones covers should be examined and all those worn and tattered should be replaced never let a book leave the library without a stout paper cover to protect it against the abuses of the careless paste is to be preferred to glue in affixing these to one cupful of flour add nine spoonfuls of water and a little vinegar a half ounce of oil of spearmint will be found an admirable preservative look to it that each book is numbered in accordance with its corresponding place on the shelf during the six weeks that the library remains closed to all but yourself there is an excellent opportunity to compile your catalogue examine your books with great care to see that none have crept in which have an immoral or debasing character or which contain pernicious and unsound theology a few books of moral tendency may be included for the young their elders will choose these for surely children are not to be permitted in the library themselves to the disturbance of all others cast out and destroy any book which is merely frivolous and empty of all serious meaning for the true object of literature is to instil wisdom and to lead to habits of grave meditation and there always are those whose vapid minds will feed if it be allowed on nothing but that which amuses for the moment such must not be abetted make the most of every moment during the period of the annual examination for you can then be assured that the books are safe and well cared for rather than spread abroad and distributed hither and thither eight month august begins on monday comes now great august and the dog-star burns from sultry heat without the scholar turns to where his books in well-appointed rows assure true solace and the mind's repose scan well your books and heed the warning glass that marks the flying hours as they pass let no intruder interrupt your toil and no base volume your collection spoil august hath thirty-one days seventeen seventy four 
your library is now closed and so it will remain for six weeks or perchance two months these be halcyon days the annoyances to which you are subjected throughout all the year vanish away and there is naught to disturb you master enoch sneed for whom i am ever ready to testify my reverence has written i am so be pestered and bothered by persons insinuating themselves into the library to get books that frequently i am near to my wit's end there have been days when i was scarce able to read for two hours consecutive without some donkey breaking in upon my peace only the thought of the annual examination sustains me then forsooth i can defy them all and read in some security the necessary tasks of the examination which i described last month are easily performed in a week or less indeed if you omit the preparation of the catalogue and worthy master enoch sneed deems it better not to compile a catalogue both as an unavailing bother and moreover as the absence of it makes you more secure in your office then in this case you have a goodly season for the relishment of your books how agreeable on these sultry days is the library the rays of the sun which descend so fierce outdoors are tempered inside its walls and your footsteps as you walk hither and yon among the alcoves echo loudly a lonely sound say you not so the lover of books is not affected by loneliness when he is encompassed by his friends on every shelf they stand none missing i hope truly and all at your service parents of children are said to be more delighted in their possession when the offspring are safe in their beds than at any other time though i trust i may be pardoned for making a seeming comparison between books and such a subject as children yet it may be said that it is true of the librarian that he is most content when all his books are in the library under his protection for he can be no lover of books if he be at ease when his books are absent from the library nine month september begins on thursday september seventh month in ancient phrase and now the ninth as we compute the days abundant harvests bring the farmer joy and school's grim tasks recall the idle boy mid cooler days and early setting sun we see the autumnal equinox begun upon the hearth a cheerful blaze delights and malheur tells of arthur and his knights september hath thirty days seventeen seventy four matrimony so maintained worthy master peleg gudger is no fit diversion for the librarian and in truth i commend his wisdom in the matter the dissipations of time the vain emptinesses of amusement the general bepesterment that follows embarkation on this doubtful sea doubtful if not in fact perilous all these concomitants of the married state so conspire and agree to harass the librarian and woo him from his legitimate tasks as to behoove him to take a great oath never to allow himself to be entrapped tis the only safe course otherwise will he find himself badgered when he desires to read in peace led forth to domestic duties when he should be marshalling his books and at all times distracted and annoyed to the detriment of his profession it is true there be some who hold to the contrary dr simon bagley writes i have not found wives to be altogether a too heavy encumbrance they can dust books and at times they may be trusted to arrange the volumes properly in their places beyond this it would perchance be rash to go with them i am far from advising librarians to marry without weighing the question soberly and considering it discreetly but this i do affirm that a wife may be trained to partake in a librarian's labours in such a way as not altogether to act as a millstone about his neck it is scarce necessary to comment on dr bagley's words 
truly he impeaches his own contention by the apologetic fashion of his phrases most willingly do i mention the opinion of that diligent librarian master enoch sneed with whom on this as on every point in our profession i am rejoiced to own myself at one steer a straight course he says away from feminine blandishments these females are as leeches or bloodsuckers hardly to be torn off they would make you take your victuals at certain fixed seasons to conform to their rules of housekeeping regarding not that you may wish to read at those hours while again they will babble and complain should it chance that after a hard night's reading you ask that a hot supper be served at daybreak shun them as you would the devil ten month october begins on saturday october spreads his scarlet banner free and hoists his ensign on the dying tree as some vast giant striding o'er the earth with ruddy cheeks and countenance of mirth though ruin follows ever in his track till frost's chill finger turns the herbage black yet cheerful be and let the glass go round in wine and some good book your pleasures found october hath thirty-one days seventeen seventy four master caleb pingree's book tells of dr matthew gully who set out one day to dust the books in his library but the first volume which he plucked from the shelf was the works of herodotus which he had long desired to read yet again and at leisure and so enthralled did the worthy dr gully become in the writings of the greek historian that starting in to peruse the book he set it not down till he had read it from beginning to end thus it happened with the next book and the next the excellent doctor standing before his bookshelves holding in one hand the cloth wherewith he had purposed to wipe off the dust from the books and in the other the volume which he could not lay aside until he had read it so he abode standing and returned each day to his task yet each day reading more of the books till at last full eighteen months had passed and dr gully had read every book in the library but at that time the dust lay as thick on the books whereat he had commenced as ever it had been in the beginning also there is related an incident concerning master timothy mason the same who had his bed fitted up in the library that he might sleep near his books and thereby not suffer annoyance when he should be wakeful at night and find not the books at hand master timothy being in charge of a public library was one day reading diligently when a member of the library entered and presenting his subscription ticket begged the librarian to fetch him a certain book master timothy being incensed at this interruption of his reading and chancing at that moment to see the constable passing the library did put out his head from the window and bawl loudly for the constable to come in when the latter had entered he gave the member into custody of the officer preferring against him a charge of disturbance of the peace eleven month november begins on tuesday november's early days though still and mild presage black winter and his tempests wild prepare for cold and hug the chimney nooks nor fail to make provision for your books the broken window or the roof that leaks may ruin all your books these stormy weeks and when all's safe from driving snow or rain then sit you down and think with wise montaigne november hath thirty days seventeen seventy four the admirable timothy mason of whom we read last month was wont to walk with a book held before his nose reading as he passed along the street he looked neither up nor down as he walked but fixed his attention upon the page before him being somewhat short of vision though wearing powerful lenses in his spectacles 
it was his custom to leave the library when it lacked a few minutes of six o'clock in the evening he had found that his walk brought him to his dwelling at the moment that the town clock struck the hour one evening in midsummer the worthy librarian set out for his home holding before him and reading with earnestness the ecclesiastical polity of the learned hooker now it chanced that the town clock had become damaged the librarian hearing not the customary ringing strode past his door despite the loud cries of his housekeeper continued down the street never for an instant relaxing his zeal for reading at seven o'clock the excellent man was still walking in the direction of the neighbouring town and only at a quarter after eight when the failing light caused him to glance up did he perceive that he had travelled over six miles and arrived at the market-place of the next town having perused the greater part of the ecclesiastical polity on the journey the librarian was sore perplexed for at first he failed to recognize his surroundings and he was unable to account for the hooting rabble that dogged his footsteps in the custom of such vulgar persons when they discover a stranger of unusual aspect he was also at a loss to understand how his shoes and hose had become so befouled and bemired for he was unaware that he had crossed diverse brooks and forded sundry watercourses during his journey it might have fared ill with master timothy had not master caleb perkins a brother librarian chanced to encounter him at that moment through the good offices of this friend master timothy was provided with comfortable lodgings for the night and on the morrow suitably conveyed to his own home twelve month december begins on thursday december ends the train his whirling snows bring now the yearly pageant to a close the fields are white and leafless are the trees while frost commands the ponds and rivers freeze as books you read when first the year begun so now read books when all the year is done and not in winter summer spring nor fall neglect to read the greatest book of all december hath thirty-one days seventeen seventy four there is none so felicitous as the librarian and none with so small a cause of ill content jealousy or rancour no other profession is like his no other so happy of the clergy i speak not their calling is sacred and not of this world the physician and lawyer administer to the ills and evils of mankind the merchant's happiness is conditioned upon his pecuniary success but the librarian so far removed from any of these ministers to the wisdom and delight of mankind increases his own knowledge lives surrounded by the noble thoughts of great minds and can take no concern of pecuniary success forasmuch as such a thing is not within the boundaries of possibility if any may rival him in good fortune it is the author who produces some great work of which the librarian shall stand as humble guardian but even here again a little reading suffices to show that authors have frequently lived in turmoil or penury dying destitute or wretched because that public esteem which was necessary to their contentment had been withheld until long after they had quitted this earth the librarian as he cannot hope for wealth nor fret his mind about it so he cannot expect to achieve fame where is the monument erected to a librarian great monarchs and warriors have theirs in ancient times it was even a custom thus to honour the poet but the librarian lives and dies unknown to fame the durable results of his labours are not visible to the eye and if at all he receiveth honour it is for his private character as a man his brother librarians may know and esteem him as an ornament to their profession and that is his sufficient reward he lives protected avarice neither of money nor of worldly fame and happy in the goodliest of all occupations the pursuit of wisdom 
this is the ending of the old librarian's almanac for anno domini 1774 to my learned brethren i wish all health and joy a sure and certain cure for the bite of a rattlesnake made public by abel puffer of staunton if the sufferer be bit in the leg as it is very likely to happen let him be placed in a reversed position that is with his head down and his feet in the air it may be most convenient to lean him so against a wall or fence and if neither be at hand then against a tree or bush then without any delay whatsoever let there be applied to the place where the fangs have punctured the skin a plaster made in the following manner beat to a soft or pulpy consistency six plantain leaves that have previously been washed mingle with them twelve drops of liquor obtained in this fashion soak in half a cup of rain-water the heart of a large gander add a third part of an ounce of the dried roots of the yarrow some bruised coal-wort a spoonful of the blue flag dried and powdered four or five stalks of the common pennyroyal a half ounce of the rind of roasted crab-apples some preserved blossoms of alicumpane and eight peppercorns this liquor should simmer slowly for forty-eight hours and when it is about finished add a few seeds of the indian gourd removing them however at the end of an hour when the drops from the resulting liquor are mixed with the paste of plantain leaves the plaster should be applied on the wound and mark that all depends that this is done within ten minutes from the time when the sufferer was bitten it may be well that a minister of the gospel be sent for if so be it that one is at hand then require the sufferer to move his limbs about at first slowly now with increasing speed till he do thrash them about with all the vigour and rapidity in his power after this let him rise and run in a circle or nearly so first giving him to drink half a glass of jamaica rum when he be ready to fall from dizziness which flushes the brain with blood again apply a second plaster like the first tokens of improving health are sure to be seen in the sufferer if not prayers had better be addressed to providence end of the old librarian's almanac by philo biblos